I'm gonna be honest with you, if you're looking for this video to be the easy, how do I just immediately get a ragdoll set up on my model? As far as I know, that, that doesn't exist. Hey, Chris here from Mom Academy, here to help you. Yes, you. Make your game dev dreams become a reality. Hooking up a ragdoll is a little bit of a tedious process, but you can get some really good results and there are some tools that'll help you get it set up more easily. Unity provides us a way to mostly automatically generate a ragdoll with colliders and character joints. There are three main components of making a ragdoll. There's the character joint, there's the collider, and there's the rigid body. The way these work is, let's start with the collider because you're probably the most familiar with this one already. The collider just defines the shape that we're going to use to handle those impacts for this particular piece of the body. I use capsules for most of these because, you know, your arm is kind of capsule shaped and just ends up working pretty okay. The next one is the rigid body. That's the most common thing that we use when we're talking about physics is colliders and rigid bodies, right? The rigid body, the key two things there are the mass and the drag. Remember the mass is in kilograms, so if you're used to using pounds, if you're in the US, because we're like the only ones that use it, you'll have to kind of convert that and think about, okay, well, for this piece of the body, how heavy should that be? Is it 10 pounds, 20 pounds, and then do the conversion into kilograms and set that as the mass. Unity will do this by default for you with our tool based on the total weight of the body. And the third thing is the character joint. That defines the range of motion that a particular joint can do. So like my elbow only can go this much, right? Like there's relatively limited and I start going forward and backwards, it actually starts rotating here, not down here. So defining these on the character joints can be a really tedious process. The tool we're gonna to use that Unity gives us by default does a pretty good job about setting these up automatically for us. So the most tedious process is removed. Once we have the character joints defined with all the places we can possibly bend, we have the colliders to represent the area of the body that we're talking about. And we have rigid bodies assigned describing the weight and how much drag should be there. Then we have a ragdoll. The problem that we have is this ragdoll will by default be enabled and you generally want your characters to be animated using an animator. There are some types of games where they're doing what they call active ragdolls, where you kind of have a ragdoll and you're just applying forces to them to try to make them move. If that's the kind of game you are making, then you don't need to worry about this problem. But for most of us, we're usually talking about a ragdoll after something has died or is unconscious or whatever the case is. But the rest of the time, they're gonna be controlled by an animator. The animator will override all the properties that we have on the ragdoll. So the ragdoll movement will not be working if we have the animator enabled. So we need some way to toggle between the two. In this video, I'm gonna show you one way to do it. It's not the most performant way towards the end of the video after we've looked at how does this work. We'll look at more performant ways that are more complicated to set up. That's usually how it goes, right? The, the simple way is not performant and the more complicated way it gets more performing, but it's kind of harder to tell what's going on and more work to set up. Whenever you're choosing a solution like this, you should consider what's my performance target. Does this meet my performance target? Am I gonna have 300 people running around? All that can potentially go to Ragdoll. If so, then you probably wanna spend more time optimizing that than somebody who's gonna have like two characters on screen at a time. Performance overhead of having just two probably isn't that big of a deal. And it'll probably run fine on your target platform. But again, you need to profile it, see how does it work and see where the optimization can be applied. Before we go any further, I wanna give a huge shout out to all of my Patreon supporters. Every one of you is helping this channel grow, reach more people, and add value to more people, and that means more people are making their game dev dreams become a reality. If you wanna help support that mission, you can go to patreon.com slash academy, choose whichever tier you're most comfortable with. You'll start getting some cool perks like getting your name up here in this section and getting a voice shout out starting at the awesome tier. Speaking of those awesome supporters, I have Andrew Bowen, Gerald Anderson, Autumn K, Paul Barry, and Matt Parkin. I am so grateful for your support. Thank you. Today I'm going to pull an asset off the asset store. So if you have already checked this out on GitHub, make sure to first import this asset from the asset store. Link in the description and on the readme about where to get this asset. Which asset you use is not really important as long as a humanoid. Actually, it does not have to be a humanoid shape. But for the auto construction tool that we're going to use that Unity gives us, it does. You can still do this with any kind of model as long as you hook it up with these components that we're going to take a look at. The humanoid restriction is only to use this tool that will automatically add some of these and generally size colliders for us. What we have is a prefab of zombie one. And if I drag that into the scene, you can see that we have a zombie. He's a little bit smaller than I want him to be. So I'm going to scale him up to be 1.5 scale instead of just one. And if we were just to click play here, we'll see that this zombie animates. 
One thing I have done is in the animation panel, I've removed all the state transitions so that way this zombie is always idle. Now that we have a zombie, which is a humanoid-like model, I'm going to go to Game Object 3D Ragdoll. This is gonna open up our humanoid importer I was just talking about a second ago, where we have to drag the bone game object transforms to each of these, and then Unity will add in, based on some information about these bones, a character joint, a collider, and a rigid body. We'll look at what are those three components as it relates to the ragdoll in just a second, but first let's start hooking up these transforms. For the pelvis, we have something called base human pelvis. That kind of makes sense. Let's drag that there. For all these other ones, they don't always name exactly the same as what the Unity inspector is asking us for. For example, here next up they have left hips, but I have base human L leg thigh. The important thing to do is look at where is this transform on the human body and determine is this the right one here. Since we're talking about left hips, where this transform is, that looks like a left hip. So I'm going to go ahead and use this one for the left hip. Similarly, I have a left leg calf that will correspond to the left knee and a foot for the foot. The good thing is, usually once you figure this out for one side, you can just do the exact same for the other side. So I'll use again for right hips, the R thigh. We'll use the R calf for the right knee and the R foot for the right foot. When we start looking at the left arm, it's not really immediately clear which one should we use because I have like the collarbone, the left arm, upper arm. And they're pretty close to each other on the model. I actually had to trial and error this one to find out that the L arm, upper arm is the correct one to use here. It's really more like the shoulder is what you're looking for for this one. And then on this one, we call it a forearm for the elbow. And you'll notice there's no hands. So that's one interesting thing here that we include the foot, but not the hands. We'll do the same again for the right arm. And then it's asking for a middle spine and head. As I click through the positions here, I can see that base human spine two looks to be about a middle spine. So I'm gonna drag that one. And I've got one for human head to be the head. That sounds good. Next up, we have total mass. This is usually in kilograms. So I'm gonna put something like, I don't know, 60 is probably good for a zombie. I actually couldn't figure out what the strength is for. I've tried putting something like a thousand and zero and I end up getting the exact same thing generated. And even checking out the Unity documentation page for this, there's just no information about what does this do. My guess is it does nothing. So it doesn't matter if you put zero, hundred, a thousand, you get the same thing. The weight is distributed across all the rigid bodies that are generated though. So if you're saying that some model is 60 kilograms and then we're gonna come back later and add in some hands that are gonna have some kind of weight, remember that we're increasing the overall weight of this character, which probably when you're using the ragdoll doesn't matter, but if you're trying to be really realistic, that's something to keep in mind. If your model's facing the wrong way, you can also use flip forward to flip them 180 degrees. Once you've created this, you'll see a bunch of colliders get added and you can actually select in the hierarchy each one of these components we just dragged and see what kind of information was added for the character drawing for the collider and the rigid body. The important thing to look at here though is all these colliders that got generated. These, the character joints, and the rigid bodies will drive the physics. The colliders will obviously be used to detect the collision whenever the limbs are flailing about in the ragdoll form. We'll immediately see that the head is not perfectly aligned, the forearm is relatively large compared to the upper arm, and the legs are also kind of fat compared to what the actual models are. We'll see that the feet are totally missing, and again, we have no hands. The torso is pretty good, but maybe a little bit too short. So this does get you started, but there is some tweaking required to make it work correctly, or to get a realistic look. What I'll do is I'll start on the left arm, and I'll readjust these so that way they look more like how I would expect the colliders to be generated or how they should be. The key thing is that these colliders should not intersect with one another because once we enable them, if they're inside of each other, we get some really weird physics results. So I will come in, realign, make sure stuff's not intersecting and just make it more match the model. After this, then you can decide, do you want to add in hands and feet collisions? That way they don't end up clipping through stuff. I did choose to do this. So to do that, we just have to manually add our character joint, a capsule collider and a rigid body should be added for us. Hook up the connected body to the character joint that we're connected to. Let's start with the left foot. I'll select the base human L leg foot. I'll add a capsule collider and a character joint. When I add the character joint, the rigid body will automatically be added for me. I'll resize the capsule collider that I added to match approximately what the foot looks like. I'm not gonna touch the rigid body. I'm gonna leave it alone as it is. And on the character joint, I'll drag the base human L leg calf to the connected body. Because we have the auto configure connected anchor set up, it's going to automatically configure how this joint can twist spring and the limits on those. That means we don't have to spend a lot of time hooking up how can this particular limb move. So I'll leave all of the rest as the defaults that Unity hooks up for us. And then I'm gonna repeat the same process on the right foot. A good tip here is if you copy the component of the collider, cause that kind of takes the most time to set up, you can just paste it onto this one and it'll be automatically set up for you. 
you can re-add the character joint and then just drag the base human R calf to the connected body and it'll again set everything else for us. We'll follow the exact same process for the hands. I'm actually gonna even copy paste the collider again and then just adjust it based on how big this hand is so that way I get a little bit of a head start on setting it up. And again, on the left hand, we're gonna drag the L arm forearm, which connected body we're attaching is just the closest body that it's connected to. So in this case, the forearm is what's connected to the hand. So we're gonna drag that as the connected body. The problem that we run into now is if I just click play, my zombie is still animated the way they were before. The animator component cannot be active at the same time that we want our model to be a ragdoll. So what I could do is just disable this animator, but then my zombie will always be a ragdoll. We need a way at runtime to be able to swap between animated mode and ragdoll mode for most games. To handle this, what I've done is created a ragdoll enabler script the key thing is that we need to first hook up the animator reference in the inspector and drag the base transform that we want to search for all of the parts of the ragdoll. So I'm using the base human pelvis in this case. The rest of all of this, we're just going to leave alone. I'll then drag this ragdoll enabler to the ragdolls list on the ragdoll runtime GUI and click play. So our zombie starts off animated. What's going to happen when I click enable ragdoll is the animator is going to get disabled because we don't want it to be controlled by the animator anymore. We want it to be a ragdoll and we're going to enable all of these ragdoll components. Shortly afterwards, I'll apply some explosive force so that way they all kind of go explode and we can see some ragdoll effect that looks pretty cool. But some problem that we see here is like the head kind of wobbles back and forth quite a bit and the zombie just doesn't really stop moving. Like we, it takes him a long time at least, right? There's a couple of reasons for this. One is that we're using the default physics material of nothing, which doesn't apply friction very well. Another thing is the head never touches the ground. If we look really closely, it's not able to bend far enough down or come far enough down to actually make contact with the floor. So it's just kind of going back and forth all the time. And there's two ways you can address the head kind of flopping around everywhere. Number one is we can apply a physics material to it and apply some friction, but we need to make sure we have a material set up on both the floor and each of the colliders for the zombie. So I've created two, one called zombie flesh and one called floor, and I've already assigned the floor to be attached to the floor and to assign the zombie flesh to all the colliders underneath. The easiest way that I know how to do this is to search for a collider or the specific type of collider that you want to assign them for. Since a zombie has three collider types, the capsule collider, the sphere collider, and the box colliders, we'll need to select those independently. I happen to remember that the head, the spine, and the pelvis are the three that are not capsule colliders. So I'll select all the other ones and then come back and do the two box colliders. That's the pelvis and the spine and the head separately and attach the material to be the zombie flesh material. The values you provide here really depend on the effect you want. You can play with each of these to see kind of how does it work the best for you. The values I settled on were 0.33 for both the dynamic static friction, 0.25 for the bounce to give them a little bit of bounce there and leaving average as the two combined modes. I've included a link to the Unity documentation about these physics materials to give you a little bit more understanding about what do each of them do. I don't want to spend a whole ton of time going over those materials, but it can be really helpful to understand what do exactly do they do before you just start messing with the values. The other cause for a head kind of bobbling all over the place is maybe your chest collider is too large and it prevents the head from actually being able to reach the ground. In that case, it's going to kind of bounce back and forth. And regardless of how much friction you apply, nothing will happen because it's not making contact with anything. You can shrink the chest collider some to help with that. And you can also increase the angular limits of the head. So that way it has more freedom to actually reach something on the ground and start rubbing against it, where it will then apply that friction that we were talking about based on the physics material that we've applied. You can of course use the zombie that I have here as reference for all of the values if you particularly like the way that this one works. But remember the sizes of all these colliders will vastly vary depending on your actual model. You wanna align them as closely as possible to your 3D model to prevent clipping, but you also maybe don't have it perfectly aligned because you need a little bit more freedom for these body parts to flail around after they go into ragdoll mode. It's really hard to tell you, oh, just do this and it's gonna work because it really depends on the model and there's a lot of configuration options you can do and tweak here to get really different results. 
Now that we've taken a look at this, let's actually look into this script about the ragdoll enabler. As I was saying before, this is a pretty simple script and the point of it is to make your ragdolls as optimized as possible by default. A little bit later in the video, I'll talk about some other optimization options and some trade-offs that you can make if you don't want all of these objects active because you cannot just disable a rigid body. That presents some unique challenges here. On awake, what I do is get a reference to all the rigid bodies, all the joints and all the colliders that are underneath the ragdoll root. We check if start ragdoll is true, then we'll enable the ragdoll. Otherwise, we'll enable the animator because we want these to always be animated. Or at least the assumption is that you will by default have them animated and once they die, they will go into ragdoll mode. In enable animator, all we do is enable the animator and then disable the joint collisions, disable all of the colliders and tell the rigid bodies to not use gravity and to not detect collisions. The point of this is to try to minimize the amount of performance overhead associated with having all of these components on our game objects. On the enable ragdoll, we will disable the animator and basically do the inverse of what we just did on enable animator, meaning we will enable collisions on all the joints, we will enable all the colliders, we will tell the rigid bodies to detect collisions and to use gravity again, and one really important thing is to set the velocity to zero of all of these rigid bodies. If you don't reset the velocity, then if you maybe accidentally added some explosive force or some force got applied to any of these rigid bodies, once we enable all these colliders and all of these enable collisions of the joints, your ragdoll effect will have some really weird behavior because probably you'll have some random force maybe applied to the head and they'll go flying off in one direction, even though you shot them in the foot and they died. So really there's not a lot of code here. We're just trying to minimize the performance impact of having these rigid bodies active. To check the performance of this, I made something like 80 zombies, all with this idle animation that go to ragdoll at the same time. You'll see that they explode into the air. And if I bring up the profiler, we'll see that a lot of physics stuff starts happening while all of these are moving around. When I click animator, there's a brief drop where the physics basically does nothing. And then when I click enable ragdoll again, there's a lot going on. It seems to be running pretty okay on my powerful PC. If we take a look at the CPU usage, we'll see a huge spike when we enable the ragdoll because we're applying explosive force to a large number of rigid bodies. It quickly rolls down to a more reasonable number and we'll see that the physics processing while animators are enabled, while it takes something like 10 milliseconds, isn't outrageous. Even when they're all ragdoll, the performance of this is pretty good. Some other alternatives to this in case this performance isn't working for you because you have too many models on the screen that can potentially go to ragdoll. Number one, there are some paid assets that claim to be able to mix Mechanum and the ragdoll system and not have an issue with this. I haven't used any of these, but there are some on the asset store. If you just search for ragdoll, you'll see what I'm talking about. Number two, which may be viable, maybe not depending on your game, is you can have two separate models, one that's animated and one that's the ragdoll. Depending on how you're going to actually make this character go into the ragdoll state, and what their animations look like, this may be okay. But a big problem here is the state of the animator of your animated model will not be applied to your ragdoll. Meaning if you have somebody in like the T pose, right? As the default animation, when you swap out and disable the animated model for the ragdoll model, the ragdoll model is not gonna look anything like the state that you had in the animated model. If they're being exploded and you apply a bunch of force to them, maybe the player won't notice that this transfer happened. But that's the biggest problem that I see here is that whenever you have the animated go to the ragdoll, you're gonna have some desynchronization of the animation and it could really be jarring for the player. The third option that I think is probably the most performant option here is to only have one model. Instead of having one model that has the rigid bodies and the colliders and the character joints always active on it, what you can do is hook these up as needed when something's going to go into a ragdoll state. So all of your ragdolls are gonna have the same configuration one way or the other. So you can create something like a scriptable object that stores the values of each of these character joints, rigid bodies, and colliders, and applies them to the correct bones at runtime whenever you're gonna transfer from the animator to the ragdoll. Once you've added all these components, you apply the force, whatever killed them, maybe they got hit in the head, so the head needs to go flying off to the side, apply the force to the head, disable the animator, and then you'll have that ragdoll. Once you want that to go away, you just remove all those components again and you're running without all those physics operations. I'm sure there are other ways to approach this. These are just the ones that immediately came to mind when I'm thinking about how would I go about optimizing this. Ragdolls are a lot of fun to add into your game. They kind of add some fun, some funniness because weird stuff happens with them and it's really rewarding for the players. If you got value out of this video, please consider liking and subscribing to help the channel grow, reach more people and add value to more people. Remember there's new videos posted every tutorial Tuesday and I'll see you next week.